the great 1974 film The Godfather 2. There's a scene about halfway through where Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone and all the American gangsters are gathered on a patio in Havana. And it's Hyman Roth's 67th birthday. And he's giving a slice of the cake each gangster. He's like, Louie from Chicago, you run the Copacabana. Frankie, you get the prostitutes. He's dividing up the island among all the American gangsters. And the, the, appropriately enough, the birthday cake has the outline of Cuba on it. So he's giving him a slice of Cuba. And while Hyman Roth is doing this, he says, isn't it great to be in a country with a government that respects private enterprise? And that's how media policies have been done in the United States for the past 50 years. And it's increasingly in the last 20 years. Extraordinarily powerful lobbyists duke it out behind closed doors for the biggest slice of the cake. The public knows nothing about it, it doesn't participate. And that's the problem we face. Media is the nervous system of a democracy. If it's not functioning well, the democracy can't function. We're heading toward an election where most people are never going to be in a room with Kerry or Bush. What they learn about the candidates will be what the media shows them or tells them, decides not to show, not to tell. People are faced with critical choices about the future of the country when they go into the voting booth. And I go in, and I have been, through the course of a campaign cycle, subject to false, distorted caricaturing. And I may not even know where it's coming from, because often there's an echo effect off places like cable and like radio. And those wrong pieces of information are repeated and repeated. By the time it reaches me, I don't even know what the source was. This is the environment we're living in, and it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's fundamentally undermining democracy, which is based on knowing some good and solid information so I can make an informed choice. See the properties Rupert Murdoch owns around the world, the strong conservative point of view that those properties often reflect, it's different than ABC or CBS or NBC. Sure, they reflect a point of view, but not nearly as strong and not nearly as consistently from one ideological perspective. Murdoch actually bought the station in 1985 and actually left us alone for at least the first three years of his ownership, partly because we were so successful and prosperous uh, that there was no reason to uh, monkey with us. At WTTG, our success insulated us to a certain degree. And it was kind of like being in an office and seeing people come down with the flu around you. We knew the flu eventually might reach us, uh, but we were hoping if we took enough vitamins that we'd never catch the flu. It was clear during those years that Murdoch, who had absolutely adored Ronald Reagan, adored him, had a lot of admiration for the group of Republicans that controlled Congress and certainly on Capitol Hill. We received an order from one of Murdoch's uh, apparatchiks, if you will, that we should cut away from our newscast and start carrying a fawning tribute to Ronald Reagan that was airing at the Republican convention. Uh, we were stunned uh, because up until that point, we were allowed to do legitimate news. And suddenly we were ordered from the top to carry propaganda, carry Republican right-wing propaganda. There was a cultural uh, underpinning to what Murdoch wanted. Uh, race issues, AIDS, uh, I constantly remember complaints that there was too much being done on AIDS. He also couldn't stand the Kennedys. Ted Kennedy was a longtime opponent of Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and, and one uh, a celebrated occasion, we were ordered to run a long, uncut piece from a current affair uh, that was uh, rehashing the whole matter of uh, Chappaquiddick. It had zero news value we were told you had to run this thing uncut. You could not even edit it down and just run a snippet of it. Uh, I think they evolved uh, in later years 
uh, especially after Roger Ailes took over and, and really got the uh, Fox News Channel up and running into a far more sophisticated kind of operation. What we saw in my era was, was really the, the birth of this sort of thing and the roots of what came later. I'd just like to say how delighted I am that we've now reached this moment when we can firmly announce uh, the starting of a Fox News Channel and a much greater effort on the build-up of Fox News uh, in every area. We'd like to be premier journalists. We'd like to uh, restore objectivity uh, where we find it lacking, and, uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, there, there could be that interpretation because of my background, but I left politics a, a number of years ago and have run a news organization for the last two years. So we just expect to do fine, balanced journalism. I was a Fox employee for three years. I worked in the uh, news. On air or behind the camera? I'd rather not answer that. I, I think I'd rather keep myself anonymous. You'll disguise my voice. Yeah, I've heard directly from folks, uh, both as correspondents and as bookers, who've expressed very great reservations, uh, almost uh, as if they're being monitored by a Stalinist system, uh, afraid to be seen talking to the wrong person or uh, having the wrong kind of email exchange. You're either one of us or one of them. And in leaving Fox News, for example, uh, there were a number of people at the organization, the head of the organization, tried to ruin my career simply because I was leaving, because I didn't leave on their terms, because I refused to sign a confidentiality agreement. That was another reason for them to try to keep me from getting my next job. very much a, an environment of fear. It was made very clear to us that our activities were being monitored, and if someone wasn't watching it live, they were at least recording it, and they would review it after the fact to see what we did. We weren't necessarily, as it was told to us, a news gathering organization so much as we were a proponent of a point of view. Fox has already been successful in sort of branding me as somebody who can't be trusted, and as a result, um, I'm already sort of on thin ice regarding my current employer. I'd been warned by people. Um, there were a number of people who pulled me inside and said, look, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know that you want to work and I know that you need a job, but you might want to think twice about taking this job because really it is a very conservative news network. Now that I've learned comedy writing at Fox News Channel, I guess I should be doing stand-up in the clubs. I think that if you don't go along with the mindset of the hierarchy in New York, if you challenge them on their attitudes about things, your history. I suspect your research has discovered the memoranda that were written by John Moody and by Roger uh, in terms of setting the tone for the day. Uh, the message of the day is a very political uh, device. Let's spend a good deal of time on the battle over judicial nominations, which the president will address this morning. Nominees who both sides admit are qualified are being held up because of their possible, not demonstrated, views on one issue, abortion. This should be a trademark issue for FNC today and in the days to come. There was nothing covert about the way uh, the managing editors in New York or Washington operated. They made it perfectly clear what they expected from us. The so-called 9-11 Commission has already been meeting. This is not what did he know and when did he know it stuff. Do not turn this into Watergate. Every morning there was a detailed uh, list of subjects to talk about not talk about. Kerry's speech on the economy at Georgetown is likely to move on to the topic of Iraq. We should take the beginning of the Kerry speech and see if other news at the time is more compelling. It is not required to take it start to finish. They were just actually issuing edicts to the reporters to control what they could say and how they could say it. Let's refer to the U.S. Marines we see in the foreground as sharpshooters, not snipers. 
which carries a negative connotation. When headquarters sent a memo every morning and said, we want to touch on the following issues, we want to cover the following stories, we want to do them in this particular way, our job and our objective then was to execute the plan. The pictures from Abu Ghraib prison are disturbing. Today we have a picture, aired on Al Arabiya, of an American hostage being held with a scarf over his eyes, clearly against his will. Who's outraged on his behalf? The real revolutionary breakthrough of Fox has been, it's eliminated journalism. I mean, that's the thing to understand. What Fox News Channel has done is it's stripped out any notion of journalism as we've traditionally understood it from its product. There is no journalism at the Fox News Channel. Why? The person, Listen, cut his mic. The, that Listen, was Chad, the starter's stop, pistol. Stop, Let stop, me stop, stop, stop. Let me Chad, I'm going to test if you're an honest individual. In our right. bodies I'm and sorry to cut you off. I know not, we're in some controversial fair. stuff here, but it's my religion fair. didn't teach me that. But thank you very much for being here. it's a right-wing network, and you don't want to hear this stuff. You want to do. Not about the kid. It's about you, Jamie. That's good. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. About about me, the I'm doing, I'm Thank doing, you. Uh, yes. I'm, Good night. I'm doing. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Sir, 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 don't take your votes. cheap little pathetic shot. I am telling you that that's you're what you're taking it cheap little pathetic shots. Just giving his record. To tell you what the truth is. No, you're misrepresenting his record. I'm telling the truth, sir. That's the truth, sir. That's the truth about his record. I understand what your position is. It's not correct. I'd like to hear one single you're on satellite one radio sing because you right, can't get on regular radio. Paula Evans, Winston Salem, North Carolina. Bill, if you are so concerned about public figures being bad role models for children, please stop rudely interrupting your guests and telling them to shut up. Well, the shut up line has happened only once in six years, Miss Evans. Well, you know, I think that asking a student to stay in the closet in order to go I'm to school is a lot like asking an African American student. No, no, no. Student. You want to know what I was up. doing? Shut up. Uh, please as don't respect, tell me to shut up. As respect. Why did you have to tell him you were an atheist if you didn't have any trouble reading the oaths? Why didn't you just shut up? What Jimmy Carter should do is privately give Mr. Bush's opinion and shut up publicly. That would be best for the country. And it is our duty as loyal Americans to shut up once the fighting begins. Once the war against Saddam begins, we expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. All he's got in six and a half years is that I misspoke that I labeled a polka war to Peabody. He writes it in his book, he tries to make me out no, to no, be No, 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 hey, no, that's shut not up. No, you, you had shut your up. 35 minutes, shut up. The techniques of poll, odd polling and odd graphics of Democrats and weird banners in the lower third of your screen, these are all pretty sophisticated techniques and they work in collaboration with the most genius marketing slogan in history, which is fair and balanced. So if you're the graphics department and you can put up a liberal flip-flopper as the Chiron, hey, that's great because the next time the graphics department has a discussion with management, management say, yeah, you guys have been doing a great job. Graphics are always moving in the background. They've sort of pioneered the use of the American flag as, as an icon of your news broadcast. So there's a lot of stuff that people come up with on their own, which in other news organizations, you'd never think of coming up with some of the stuff, much less even putting it on the air. But at Fox News, there's sort of a, the, you're rewarded for pushing the envelope. And if you're pushing the envelope against a Democrat and it's supportive Republican, that's great. The problem comes if you try to push the envelope or God forbid, should put in some sort of similar sort of style or approach to Republican, then you get yourself in trouble. Probably 1999, I created the Fox News Alert. We were striving to accomplish a sense of urgency. Urgency in the sense that what was about to be delivered after the Fox News alert was very important. Quote unquote shocking news, specifically Columbine and all the other important news stories of that time. But now, looking back, now that I'm not there, I find it interesting that I've seen the Fox News alert used for stories like Benefer. J-Lo and Ben's relationship. I mean, this compared to a school shooting, and there's really no relationship to me. And I don't understand why, based on what we originally created it for, uh, why they would choose to use it for a story like that. Because the sound and the visual is associated, or originally was associated, with things that were much more important. This is a Fox News alert, a very busy day for Martha Stewart. Earlier today, she met with her parole officer. No, they deliberately blur it, and I find it, I find it very hard to believe, you know, there's no separation between Bill O'Reilly, the interviewer, and Bill O'Reilly with his 
talking points. I mean, there's just no separation at all. Jimmy Carter is making yet another mistake, and this time, there's no excuse for it. And that's the memo. Now for the top story tonight, another view on this. It's very hard on Fox News to separate news from commentary because it all blends together. That's what makes it so ridiculous, that slogan, we report, you decide, because there's no TV news channel in history that's ever reported less. For example, a Brit Hume newscast, um, which is presented as a newscast, um, I think you, you see a lot of attitude and opinion uh, both from the anchor and from the reports. Welcome to Washington. I'm Britt Hume. There was further evidence today that President Bush's days of absorbing John Kerry's attacks without counterattack are over. Fox blurs the line between news and commentary all over the place. We are to believe that Britt Hume is the anchor of a news outlet. He doesn't bring strong politics to it. He just happens to anchor the newscast like Peter Jennings. On Sundays, Britt Hume turns into a rather caustic right-wing uh, pundit. Look, this goes to Murdoch, too. He doesn't believe in objectivity. He doesn't believe. He has contempt for journalism, I think. I mean, they wanted all news to be a matter of opinion, because opinion can't be proven false. And I think that's very dangerous, because if people don't have a set of facts that they can agree on, I think it's difficult to reach a consensus on, you know, what's correct public policy. It wasn't so much... Uh a scripted design that promoted the off-the-cuff ad-libs that you see so often on Fox News Channel. It was sort of a reinforcement. John Kerry is Jane Fonda with a Burberry scarf tied around his neck. Any ad-lib that made the Democrats look stupid and made the Republicans look smart would get an attaboy, a, a pat on the back, a wink or a nod. Well, you know, there's an old pizza expression, you've tried all the rest, now try the best. Some people say, especially on that panel there, those commissioners, that Condoleezza Rice might be the best, and we haven't heard from her publicly, at least Are you saying point. the commission's cheesy? You wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> They're crusty on the panel? <laughs> okay. John Kerry has Kim Jong-il on his side, Barbara Streisand. What yes. could go wrong? North Korea loves, uh, loves John Kerry. Really? Yeah. And there's no sense of integrity on, as far as having a Kerry line that can't be English. crossed. Not having that sort of line becomes very tempting for somebody to self-promote by crossing the line, saying something funny that you would never dare say if you were stepping back and looking at it from the sense of a journalism school and is this the right thing for journalism, it would never happen. Other journalists use phrases like some people say or officials say when they're trying to insert anonymously information in a story that sort of advances the storyline. Fox does it in a different way. Some people say is Fox's cue that I'm pretending to be an anchor, so I can't say this is my opinion or this is Roger Ailes' opinion, but some people say. Some, some people say that'd be a pretty good choice, bring in the Hispanic folks. Some people say, ah, he's posturing. Some Indeed. people say, and excuse me, I'll get to you, Joe, in just a second, but some people say that you may be setting up Sharpton for a run against Hillary in 2006 in the Senate. Journalistically, it's a very peculiar technique because the idea behind journalism is that you're sourcing who you're referring to. This is just sort of a clever way of, of inserting political opinion when you know it probably shouldn't be there. Some people say that this might undermine what the U.S. troops are doing there. Some people say, some people say John Kerry has some similarities to an earlier Massachusetts politician. And some people say in light of what's happened with the oil for food program. Some people say supported by Iran. Some say, I've heard a couple people say. Some say that uh, it's a sour grapes book. Some people say, some people say, some people say, some people say it's just too violent, there's too much blood. Some people say. Some people say. Well, some people say. Some people say. Uh, some say. Some people say. Some are saying. Some people say. There's some people who say something, if not major, has already happened. Those are his words. Some people say it's exploitive. What do you say to that? I was given a folder, a little binder, that had the names of all the Fox News consultants, you know, the people who were paid to come on the air to give their opinions. To be a Fox News contributor means you're under contract and you're getting paid a set amount. Joining us in D.C. is Larry Johnson, former CIA officer and former deputy director of the State Department's Office of Counterterrorism. My services were in uh, great demand in December of uh, 2001. The contract expired in January of 2003. And the first thing that I noticed was that I recognized all of the conservatives who were in the roster. Um, they were very well-known people who would come from, you know, talk radio or from some sort of political background. Um, and so I knew all of those people, and they were very, very strong people. I, I came in and was always, you know, I was going to call it as I saw it. For example, uh, the edict came down apparently to stop referring to suicide bombings in Israel as suicide bombings, to call them homicide bombings. 
I, mean, I thought that was stupid, and I continued to call them suicide bombings because every bombing that kills someone is a homicide bombing. But when I looked at the liberal roster, um, there was only one person's name who I recognized, which I recognized, and that was Bob Shrum, who is a very well-known speechwriter and political consultant in Washington. The other ones, though, were people I'd never heard of. My entire background was in politics and political journalism, so I knew pretty much all the players in D.C., and I'd never heard of these people. The question came up about the ability of the United States to fight two wars simultaneously. Going into Iraq is going to divert resources and attention that should be focused on al-Qaeda. And uh, Sean Hannity, being the you know, right-wing cheerleader that he is, was just, you know, incensed that I was had the temerity to suggest that we couldn't. We do have the ability and the resources to be we're able to walk and chew gum. We can handle the situation in Iraq, and we can still finish the uh, job of protecting um, against al-Qaeda and another attack. What happens is when the resources end up getting diverted, and particularly the airlift assets required... Facts don't seem to have uh, any effect upon him. What was unusual is it was after that appearance that even though I was under contract to Fox for another uh, eight weeks, roughly, they stopped using me. Your government failed you. Those entrusted with protecting you failed you. And I failed you. And for that failure, I would ask, once all the facts are out, for your understanding, and for your forgiveness. When Richard Clark emerged, it was obvious this was a danger to the administration because he had worked at the highest echelons of the Bush administration. And it was almost like Fox News was working off of the playbook coming out of the White House, that he had to be torn down, he had to be turned into a Democrat, a liberal, a carry guy. He is um, bringing this up in the heat of a presidential campaign. Can you assume from what he's saying that he has now become a political opponent? Do you feel that there is a political... He is, as some have suggested, auditioning for a job in the Kerry administration. Sucking up uh, to another administration. He said when he came to me to ask for my support, Support with Tom Ridge. He had been angling for a top job in uh, Homeland Security Department and did not get it. See, one of the things that Fox does and conservatives do is they don't have to win every argument, but if they can muddy the argument enough, if they can turn it into a draw, that to them is a victory because it denies the other side a victory. Well, Sean, I, I, there, there are apparently two Dick Clarks here. Dick Clark has been on three sides of a two-sided issue. Okay. He's, to he's totally contradicted himself. His statements are contradictory. There's a lot of information that contradicts Clark. And, and so aren't there sufficient contradictions? Uh, he has written a book, and he certainly wants to go out there and promote that book. Or yeah. is, is he just out to sell a book? Who's out to sell his book? Did he have a motive behind writing the book and going out on 60 Minutes and criticizing the Bush administration? Obviously, this guy's hawking a book. Unveiling his book, an appalling act of profiteering. This guy rakes Bush over the coals and gives Clinton a pass. And the book gives Clinton a complete pass. Easily, Clark treats uh, Bill, the Bill Clinton Still are some real his book. concerns about where the truth lies in what R Richard Clark was saying. They launched a major smear campaign. In some ways, it worked. I thought, number one, he was extremely melodramatic and that he was intoning with great pathos. I mean, I, it seemed, uh, it almost seemed like it was a performance. And it was just attack politics on a TV channel. Usually you leave attack politics to a political campaign. Karl Rove and company are quite good at character assassination. You know, there are all these people, dozens of people in the White House, paid for by you and I, paid for by our taxes, right? writing talking points, calling up conservative columnists, calling up talk radio hosts, mm -hmm. telling them what to say. It's interesting. All the talk radio people, the right-wing talk radio people all across the country, saying exactly the same thing, exactly the same words. I noticed that. I was watching it. There's a 24-hour news network, and I'm sure it's a coincidence, but what they were saying was remarkably similar to what the, the White House was saying, and I couldn't help but thinking uh, how funny that was. The, we are bringing diversity of opinion uh, we are, there is diversity of opinion on Fox News. You may disagree with that. We have many liberals there, many liberal uh, invited. We have liberal commentators, as we have conservative ones. Who are your liberal commentators? Just, uh, Alan Combs, for one. Um, Greta Van Sostren. Um, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. What they'll try to put on uh, the appearance of being balanced, but really kind of a mismatch. 
you'll have a Hannity and Combs show where Hannity is a really a good-looking, clean-cut, all-American kind of guy, and, and his counterpart is a little squirrely-looking, frankly. And you kind of say, he's the liberal? Well, maybe he's not so smart after all. And, and, and it sends a subtle message, I think. You're, no, Where's, you're a good liberal. I agree. Oh, good liberal, good liberal. <laughs> a lot of the times, the liberals that they get to appear on are either uh, you know, faux liberals, like I would use Susan Estridge as an example of that, a person who was brought on who essentially agrees with the person on the right in a lot of cases. You know, I am your biggest liberal friend. I do take a little heat. People sometimes say to me, do you really like Sean Hannity? What's not to like? And what I does that mean? I thought I was Sean's biggest liberal friend. I, uh, you know, I but love you all. I love all my liberal friends. Looking. Or they would just bring on people who were very weak, you know, people who were not well-known people. We can learn from history because if we don't, we're condemned to repeat it. You're not going to get the know... truth and the facts. You're going to get one guy, Clark, accusing right. Bush, saying Clinton really, you know, giving him a pass. Then you're going to get the Bush administration attacking Clark. You're not going to get the truth, Marianne. You weren't there. You right. don't know. Right. It, it, you're probably right about that. And the Even the people who are supposedly liberal in those panel discussions, they know that uh, to challenge the guests and the other hosts too forcefully um, we'll, they'll, they'll certainly find someone else to stand in your place if that's the case. You're spinning now. I'm not, I'm not right wing. I believe in global warming. We looked at special reports, one-on-one -on -one interviews. They're once a day. We studied 25 weeks of the one-on-one -on -one guest who appeared on special report from late June through mid-December of 2003. Republicans appeared five times as often as Democrats on one-on-one -on -one newsmaker interviews. That means that Republicans made up 83% of the partisan guests, while Democrats made up just 17%. In addition, the few Democrats that were interviewed for the show tended to be centrist and conservative Democrats, often brought on to affirm Bush administration policies. So what does this all mean? Well, if Fox were the bastion of fairness and balance that it claims to be, we'd see a lot more balance in this prominent interview segment on the network's most prestigious show. Instead, the numbers indicate that Brit Hume and Special Report choose their guest based on political considerations rather than news judgment. That's here on the Fox News Channel, the network America trusts for fair and balanced news. My criticism of Fox News isn't that it's a conservative channel. It's the consumer fraud of fair and balanced. It's nothing of the sort. You pitch a story in any given editorial meeting that didn't meet the criteria that they had explained to you, and you got a thumbs down. When you have this executive vice president and those around him who are consistently saying, no, we're not going to do that story, no, this story's bad, this story's good, and it becomes very clear to all the bureau chiefs, to everybody involved who have been there over a period of years, there are certain kinds of stories it's not even worth bringing up. There are other kinds of stories that you know management's going to love. Fox News Channel's uh, stated uh, practice was to embarrass, humiliate, challenge, or disrupt whatever Jesse Jackson did. But we were told on many occasions that he was one of our targets. Anything we could do or say that would embarrass him, discredit him, we were encouraged to find the information and we were encouraged to report the information. I did a piece on immigration and I thought it was poignant to tell the stories of these people and all of the things that they had to go through to get citizenship and how we take for granted how really blessed we are to be born with it. And the line that I used in describing their efforts was folks seeking citizenship earned, not born. Suggesting that, hey, they really want citizenship because they've got to go through all of these motions. But managing editor was very angry. He says, what do these people earn? They haven't earned a thing. They're just here for a free ride. They're just here trying to take advantage of all of our freebies. And, and I mean, it was just, uh, he just laid waste to the idea that these people were hardworking. It was very specifically said, we need to be fair to the Bush administration or to the Republicans than anybody else in the media would be. But that was always understood as sort of a code for layoff. I am first-hand knowledge of a reporter who was basically yelled and screamed at by executives because 
that reporter was asking tough questions of James Baker at a news conference. It was a news conference that was being carried live. James Baker was saying, we want to count every vote. And the reporter was peppering with questions like, well, wait a second, if you want to count every vote, why not go back and find the votes that were not counted because of problems with the Chad? The reporters in New York thought that this was a little too confrontational of a style. Never mind that when Warren Christopher got up there for Gore, the questions were equally tough. There were no complaints about the question of Christopher. But because the questions of James Baker were so tough, that reporter was pulled off the story and said, we can't trust you anymore. You didn't handle this story very well. Go back to Washington. Ronald Reagan's birthday was, for Fox News Channel viewers, something akin to a holy day. This was Ronald Reagan's birthday. And so my assignment was to go to the Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California, and to do live shots from uh, before dawn until, uh, until dark. There weren't very many people at the Presidential Library. There wasn't a celebration in any organized way going on. You know, there was a class of fourth graders who came to the library that day to take the tour. And they were lined up, and they sang happy birthday. But that was pretty much the extent of the celebration. They saw my first three or four live shots, and Mr. Moody called in to say, what is he doing out there? Apparently, my live shots weren't celebratory enough. And I was, frankly, at a bit of a loss as to what to say or do to make it seem like there was a big celebration. Since dawn, they've been streaming in from all over the country and even parts of Canada and Mexico admire So I got in trouble for that one. I got in big trouble for that one. In fact, I was suspended. What you will see, of course, is intensive discussion about what we call the wedge issues. You'll hear, you know, uh, affirmative action. You'll hear abortion. You'll hear certainly gay rights. Uh, God in, in uh, separation of church and state issues will be on television every single day. I think this gay marriage thing is going to be an enormous presidential issue. But there again, we have to be fair and balanced. I mean, we can't like run with that. The stampede of same-sex couples to the altar has accelerated. President Bush says he's deeply troubled by the hundreds of 2,000 same-sex same couples engaged in 2,300 and counting. That's the number same-sex couples hoping to get same-sex couples wanting to same-sex marriage. Their job, which is what the right-wing Republicans want to do, is to divide America up, ignore the important economic, health care, environmental issues, and they do that extremely successfully. They did start up on gay marriage, but I think that they got sort of blindsided. They all of a sudden couldn't show the usual footage they used to show, because they used to love to show the footage, of course, the parades and the black leather and, you know, the drag queens. Then they had, you know, very kind of normal-looking, dumpy, middle-aged couples getting married and smooching on the steps of City Hall. So I've noticed a certain kind of uh, zest going out of the gay marriage thing, but that the opposite, uh, where they've picked up the slack, is on anything to do with religion, anything to do with the Ten Commandments, anything to do with God. Why is Jesus so popular right now? Well, I think it uh, depends on who you talk to. Um, I think a lot of people would say that one of the reasons that he's uh, very popular is that Mel Gibson's movie has come out. George W. Bush, because of all this, he, he wants to see it, and I'm sure they will set up a special screening there at the White House. For oh, him. sure. Well, yeah. You know, he's, he's a devout Christian. Right. Apparently, he prays daily. Do uh, they think it's about just a movie, just entertainment, or do they think that there's really something bigger at work? Well, I think they think that there's something bigger at work. September 11th uh, threatened people, and people looked to Jesus for comfort. But number two, um, a line was drawn around the world between two kinds of um, religions, two kinds of societies. Freedom is not this country's gift to the world. Freedom is the Almighty's gift to every man and woman in this world. Boy, couldn't you just see the elite media tremble over that one? The president knows evoking the deity will anger the secular media. He doesn't care. Talking points applauded. They're going to push God very, very hard, particularly going up into Bush's re-election. All of us working together can change America one soul at a time. The Christian fundamentalist movement is one that believes in we're right, you're wrong, no matter what. And I saw a lot of that at Fox. We're right, you're wrong, no matter what. The O'Reilly Factor is probably the perfect example of everything that's wrong with Fox News Channel. You have stories that are selected primarily to upset liberals and, and Democrats and prop up 
the Republican Party. You have a hostility towards guests that disagree with the host. And you have a host who, in service of his conservative politics, will, will distort facts, will misrepresent things, and uh, will, in some cases, just fabricate. In the personal story segment tonight, we were surprised to find out that an American who lost his father in the World Trade Center attack had signed an anti-war advertisement that accused the USA itself of terrorism. Jeremy Glick is the son of a, a Port Authority worker who died in, at 9-11, and he had signed an anti-war petition, and O'Reilly had to have him on. And they were so persistent about getting me on the O'Reilly show because they found out that I was on the advisory board and signed a statement that was against the war and then I was directly impacted by 9-11. The success that I had on the O'Reilly show had to do with just practice and preparation. I taped the shows and what I did is I took a stopwatch that I used to use for running sprints in high school and I would see when he has a hostile guest and I would time how long it takes for him to cut them off. You were the only one. I was surprised and the reason I was surprised is that this ad equates the United States with the terrorists. I said, I'm shocked that you're surprised, and basically just made the only point I wanted to make. Our current president now inherited a legacy from his father and inherited a political le legacy that's responsible for training militarily, economically, and situating geopolitically the parties involved in the alleged assassination and murder of my father and countless of thousands of others. So I don't right, see why well, it's so surprising so, for you to think right. that I would come back and want to support it is surprising, escalating and I'll Bush's tell you aggression why. I'll tell you why it's area. surprising. You are a mouthing a far left position. It was extremely intimidating sitting down in the studio because he's really tall. And like, dude, like he lords over you. You see, even, I'm sure your beliefs are sincere, but what upsets me is, is I don't think your father would be approving of this. Well, actually, my father um, thought right. that Bush's presidency was illegitimate. Maybe, maybe he I did, but I don't think, think he'd Bush... be equating this country as a terrorist nation. Well, I wasn't you are. saying that it was necessarily yes, you like are. that. You what signed I'm saying this and is absolutely that said in... that. Jeremy was pretty cool during it, and he was giving his political views, which were very to the left of O'Reilly's. And he said, oh, I don't really care what you think politically. And I said, obviously, you do care because, A, you brought me on the show, and, B, I told him that he uses 9-11 and sympathy with the 9-11 families and the, lo and the lives lost to rationalize his narrow right-wing agenda. You evoke okay. sympathy that's with the 9-11 families. That's a bunch of crap. So I've done more for the 9-11 families. families by their own admission. I've done more for them than you will ever hope to do. Okay. So you keep your mouth shut well, when you're you not me exploiting me. those people. You're I not don't. Representing and I never me. represent you. You know why? Why? Because you have a warped view of this world and a warped view of this country. Well, explain and that. Let me give you an no, example of parallel. I'm not going to debate parallel. this with you. Well, let me give you All an right? example of parallel ex uh, experiences. No, on oh, September 14th. Here's, 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 here's on the record. September 14th. Here's the record. Okay. Right? You didn't support the action against Afghanistan to remove the Taliban. You were against it. Why okay? would I want to brutalize and further punish the people in who Afghanistan? Who killed your father? The people who in Afghanistan didn't father. kill my father. Sure they did. The Al-Qaeda people were trained yeah, there. The Al-Qaeda people? What we're about the See, I'm more angry about it than you are. So what about George Bush? What about George Bush? He had nothing to do with it. The director, senior, as director. He of the had CIA. nothing to so do with it. the people that trained 100,000 Mujahideen Man. who were I hope your mom isn't watching this. Oh, I well, hope she... your mother okay. is not watching this. It's unfair for O'Reilly to evoke both my mom and my father in the interview, especially when I wasn't. You know, I mean, she, my mom is a grieving widow for a prematurely, a violent, horrific turn in their lives. My dad was only 55. He was, they were working people, you know, working class, middle class, like they were not retiring for a while, they, you know, and their life is basically destroyed. You know, their life together is destroyed and destroyed in circumstances that I wouldn't wish on uh, my worst enemies, including Bill O'Reilly. Because you that's it. I'm not going to say anymore. Okay. In respect for your father, in September as a 14th, porter, you want to know what I was up. doing? Shut up. Uh, please as don't respect, tell me to shut up. Respect, in, in respect for your father, who was a Port Authority worker, a fine American, who got killed unnecessarily by barbarians. By radical extremists yeah. fine. trained by right. this government. In respect not for him. Not the people of America, I'm not the people, the ruling you. class, the small minority. Cut his mic. I'm not going to dress you down anymore. Out of respect for your father. We'll be back in a moment with okay. more of the that was, We're done? We're done.
you see him gesturing to security guards. And then came the after film performance. After they were off the air, he said to the kids something the effect, get out of my studio before I f***ing tear you to pieces. So Jeremy, and I've talked to him since, went, actually went to the green room to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> and the executive producer and the assistant encouraged me to leave the building because they were, quote, concerned that if O'Reilly ran into me in the hallway, he would end up in jail. This is our house here. If somebody comes to your house and begins spitting on the floor, you'd remove them. Glick was out of control and spewing hatred for this program and his country using vile propaganda. The next day, I just turned on and watched the, the follow-up and saw my views totally distorted. Next thing I know, I was saying Bush planned 9-11. Glick was saying without a shred of evidence that President Bush and Bush the Elder were directly responsible for 9-11. Now, that kind of stuff is not only loony, it's defamation. That paints me as, as a fringe conspiracy nut. This kid said nothing nothing about President Bush and his father, Bush the Elder, orchestrating the attack on their own country. So O'Reilly's just lying here. He came on this program and accused President Bush of knowing about 9-11 and murdering his own father. Glick said, can I sue him? And so I called the lawyer who was in my case of Fox versus Dutton and Franken, he says, well, the kid has to prove that O'Reilly knew he was lying. And O'Reilly is so crazy, he lies so pathologically, that it's harder to prove that O'Reilly knew he was lying. So oddly enough, if someone has a record of crazily lying, <laughs> it is harder to sue them for defamation. vaccine for 25 million. The key thing is don't be inhaling, don't be ingesting, don't be sucking particles into your body that could get the radiation inside. All right, we gotta run. Look at this, look at this. Um, first, your advice is stay inside, don't drink or eat anything. Many of the themes that are promoted on the Fox News Channel have to do with generating fear, whether that's fear of immigration, a fear of sexual difference, a fear of racial difference. When you pander to fear, it, it's a great motivator and organizer. You've got to keep people alarmed. They really love this sense of fear and danger, even when it's not there. And so when something is actually dangerous, as some things are, uh, they go completely overboard, and every, all sense of perspective is lost. So that anthrax, which I guess affected four or five people adversely, no question about it, is far more dangerous than you know the poisoning of our air. The way we deal with them is the way President Bush is dealing with them. You cordon the area, you search for them, and you shoot them. The motivator is fear, and then the payoff is, you know, we're going to go out and kill the bad guys. And you know, you, you, it's a very simple black and white world that they. Uh, paint and portray. Terrorism has become the all-purpose fear weapon because now everything is converted into terrorism. And of course, if you have a constant sense of unease, then you're going to look to the government to protect you. You're going to look to strong government. We've removed from power enemies of this country. We have made America more secure. There are these enemy out there. It's an ill-defined enemy, but as long as we're fighting them and we're killing them and he's looking presidential, then nothing else again is discussed. What was interesting is in the climate of the Bush administration that much of that fear, the emotion, uh, was purposely misdirected by the right wing uh, into uh, the war in Iraq. The type of coverage Fox offers, and all of them offer, but Fox is probably the most pristine version, is completely consistent with Bush's um, with, with the strategy of the Bush administration, A, to uh, prevent discussion of things that are not going well, like, for instance, the economy or the Medicare bill. There's no doubt that the war against Iraq, a country that did not attack us, could only proceed based on fear. Tonight, it's a special two-hour block. War is my last choice, but the risk of doing nothing 
is even a worse option as far as I'm concerned. Dealing with Iraq, the president's war on terror. When will his military plans get put into action? We hope you depend on us for the truth because we're going to report the situation in Iraq without an agenda or any ideological prejudice. Then you got to take what comes. Not that we hate you, Martin Sheen, but that we may not want to watch your television program anymore because we're identifying you with being against what we believe in. Americans and indeed our foreign allies who actively work against our military once the war is underway will be considered enemies of the state by me. But first, are the Americans who went over to Baghdad to act as human shields? Well, are they more than just protesters? Are they traitors? So Harry Belafonte, he's at it again. He says the Bush administration is possessed of evil. As the Calypso King on bonkers. We'll you, can, you have a right to say what you want, but we have a right Bill, not to Bill, buy your is. record. Just fair warning to you, Barbara Streisand, and others who see the world as you do. We don't want to demonize anyone, but anyone who hurts this country in a time like this, well... Let's just say you will be spotlighted. Certainly television and perhaps to an extent my station was intimidated by the administration and its foot soldiers at Fox News. And it did, in fact, put a climate of fear and self-censorship, in my view, in terms of, of the kind of broadcast work we did. The first rule of being a great propaganda system, and why our system is vastly superior to anything in the old Soviet Union, is not that people think they're being subject to propaganda. If people don't think that, they aren't looking for that, they're much easier to propagandize. And that's the genius of our media system, is a system of ideology, of control, compared to an authoritarian system. <laughs> Listen, we're making good progress in Iraq. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell it when you listen to the filter. Tremendous progress in Iraq. All the kids are back at school. 10% more than when Saddam Hussein was there. There's 100% more fresh water. It's a fresh start for Iraqi athletes. So far, 2,500 schools have been renovated. Are Iraqis better off than they were one year ago? Yes, they are definitely better off. As these brave athletes look forward to making Olympic gold. I mean, there's so many positive developments. Fox has made a decision uh, to present the Iraq war as a success and as an ongoing success. The Baghdad Equestrian Club is open for business. And yes, you can play these ponies. It's the Iraq you don't hear about. Falling unemployment, rising wages, interest rates down, foreign investment up. Life for 95% of the Iraqis is already immeasurably better than it was under the decades of Saddam's rule. There's no question about that, and that's what's the least reported story over there. You go to the markets, they're thriving. Big, fat fish coming out of the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Young men in Baghdad blowing off steam with their cars. The guys gather to put their wheels through the paces once a week, something they say they were not allowed to do under the old... The senior producer told the two or three writers for her news hour, she told us, now just keep in mind it's all good. This is such a fair and balanced issue. Keep it positive. We've got to emphasize all the good that we're doing. She at that point made a reference to rebuilding schools, bringing democracy to Iraq, and then she said, see, big progress. Yoo-hoo for us. Things were actually at that point going quite badly. Many more American soldiers were dying each day, and God knows how many Iraqis. 277 U.S. soldiers have now died in Iraq, which means that statistically speaking, U.S. soldiers have less of a chance of dying from all causes in Iraq than citizens have of being murdered in California, which is roughly the same geographical size. The People Survey is interesting because you're looking at questions of, of basic true-false kind of factual nature. Did we find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? These are very simple questions with very simple answers. And what the survey found was that the more likely you were to watch Fox News Channel, the more likely you were to have completely incorrect assumptions about these things. All the research shows a very high correlation in the case of Fox News uh, with people watching it 
uh, with having a very confused notion of the world on one hand, especially of foreign policy in the Middle East, and also being strongly supportive of the government in power. And this is an extraordinarily disturbing trend for the media. I mean, for any self-respecting journalist, if you're told the more people consume your media, the, the less they'll know about the subject and the more they'll support government policy. And that's, that's exactly the worst thing any journalist would ever want to hear or should want to hear. In terms of Fox overall, I think we have got to appreciate and when we look at them, is to understand that this is an adjunct of the Republican Party. What Fox specializes in is punditry, basically getting marching orders from the Republican National Committee or some political operative, and then having people pontificate about it, have guests come on and talk about it, uh, have pseudo-experts come on and, and discuss it. Their main allegiances, I'm talking about the people at the top, is to the Republican Party. Murdoch is, is absolutely to his core uh, a partisan, and uh, he makes no secret about that. George W. Bush sat for an interview with, in Austin with Fox News Channel's Carl Cameron, who joins us now with highlights. Hello, Carl. Hi, Brett. Well, the next it was well known in the summer of 2000 that Fox's lead political correspondent covering the Bush campaign, that his wife was campaigning for Bush. Bush does have a halo. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. Things are good. Your family? Very well. My wife has been my, hanging out with your sister. Yeah, good. My uh, county. Laura's been all over the state campaigning, and Pauline has been <laughs> constantly with her. Yeah, so Laura's a good person. My, uh, oh, she, and she's been terrific. I mean, Pauline, to hear Pauline tell it, when she first started campaigning for you, she was a little bit nervous. Yeah. But now she's she up getting there. getting her stride? She's got, she doesn't need notes. She's going to crowds, and she's got the whole riff She's down. a good soul. She's having fun, too. She's a really good soul. And in any other news organization, in fact, in CNN that very summer, there was a producer whose husband was a lawyer for the Gore team. And this was a producer who would have naturally covered Gore, who was immediately told you're not to have anything to do with campaign coverage, either covering Bush or covering Gore because of the possible conflict of interest or the perception of a conflict of interest. At Fox, they didn't care. The fact that the you know, senior political reporter, his wife, is actually campaigning for the Bush campaign at a time when this guy's covering them, that didn't even register. It never would have occurred. All right, you guys ready? All right. That's great. Here we go, Governor. <laughs> See, little things that get this close. <laughs> I like that. Thank you for joining us, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, Carl. It's good to see you again. Just a few days away from the convention. That's the lack of having some sort of basic journalistic integrity that is just missing from that organization. First person who made the call to say that George W. Bush had been elected president of the United States was the person who was in charge of Fox News's election analysis division, the people that crunch the exit polling numbers. That person was a gentleman named John Ellis, and he is George W. Bush's first cousin. At around two in the morning on election night, the, a new set of data had come in, and it was complex data with, from precincts all over Florida. The proper answer in analyzing that data unquestionably was, you couldn't tell. It was too close to call. There was simply no clear winner. Instead, John Ellis called it as a clear win for George Bush. Fox News then interrupted its ongoing election coverage and announced that George Bush had been elected president of the United States. Fox News now projects George W. Bush, the winner in Florida, and thus it appears the winner of the presidency of the United States. Now, what's significant about that is not the intervention of the president's cousin to declare his relative, the new president of the United States, it was the fact that within minutes, ABC, NBC, CBS also fell right in line, calling Bush as the winner. George Bush is the president-elect of the United States. Bush wins. ABC News is now going to project that Florida goes to Mr. Bush. There's no way that they could have crunched the data in that time to come to that conclusion. In fact, quite the opposite. They should have come to the conclusion which Associated Press came to, which was that you couldn't make a call. When Fox made the call that Bush had won, 
and the other networks followed on, that created the perception that Bush was the winner. In fact, he wasn't. But that perception was what really held for the next 37 days. And I would suggest to you that that call on election night had more to do with making George Bush president than any recount or ballot design issue. We gave our audience bad information. Our lengthy and critical self-examination shows that we let our viewers down. I apologize for making those bad projections that night. It will not happen again. In the old Soviet Union, you used to hear about the party line shifting 180 degrees. Watching Fox News at the end of Clinton, where it was all attack mode, where they were just vicious watchdogs. And then Bush takes power, and they're like little lap dogs. It was like night and day, and it's a party line shift. The president has the direction and the vision to take us into the future boldly and with, with courage and with optimism. He is an extraordinarily straightforward leader. He says what he's going to do and he does it. The president stands for steady leadership during a time of enormous change and challenge. But the president is on Air Force One and the plane has now touched down in New Mexico. This is as strong a pro-national security conservative president as I've ever seen. This is a guy who says what he means and means what he says. But the president is a gentleman, you know, he set a different tone for his campaign. to its word. And this was a super night for our candidate, John Kerry, and a super night for the Democratic Party. He's a super nominee. I believe that in 2004, one united Democratic Party, we can and we will win this election. What would you say would be uh, Senator Kerry's one or two major weak points that could be exploited? The presidential hopeful has missed every one of the 22 roll call votes in the Senate this year, but hasn't missed a paycheck. He talks about trying to protect the taxpayers every single day, and here he is fleecing the taxpayers out of $150,000 a year. So and do you think he should step down, Dominic, when he's running for president? The controversy over John Kerry and his Vietnam War medals has just gotten worse. He says he never suggested he threw them away, but the videotape does not lie. Ribbons or medals, which did John Kerry throw away after he returned from Vietnam? His perceived disrespect for the military could be more damaging to the candidate than questions about his actions in uniform. Many are angry over Kerry's post-war protests. But the bigger issue here is Kerry's involvement in a group that's inherently violent. Presumptive Democratic nominee John Kerry was scaring old people, as usual, with the predictable Democratic line. He said President Bush will cut off their entitlement checks. It isn't true, but the lie has worked well for Democrats in the past. Assuming that the unthinkable happens and that, that Senator Kerry becomes president. You're watching Fox News, real journalism, fair and balanced. They will give you the, the, almost the full Bush stump speech, no matter where it is, no matter how many times they've shown it. Go cut live to these campaign rallies as if there was going to be real news in them, as if Bush was going to say anything earth-shattering. And your uh, ability to make good decisions, like marrying your wife, Carolyn. Fox portrays his every action as a heroic move, as a, you know, something dramatic and significant. I imagine it's pretty hard for the Fox producers. Some days George Bush doesn't do anything interesting, and yet they've got to find something that makes him heroic that day. Most people just started waking up and saying, oh, you mean we don't have the fairness doctrine anymore? I can't tell you how many times when I was a political candidate running for office, I would have somebody come up to me on the street and say, now I saw your opponent on TV the other day. Aren't they supposed to give you equal time? And I didn't even know for years that we lost that in the Reagan era, that for years we haven't had the ability to expect both sides to be adequately covered. Clearly on the Republican side, what we do know is that for years they have coordinated what they call uh, their message of the day. So you'll hear on the floor of the House, you'll hear on Rush Limbaugh, you'll hear on uh, Fox and Rupert Murdoch's network the issue of the day which they will pound away at which then creates the echo chamber, which resonates throughout America.
here's what he said. I actually did vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it. Senator Kerry recently said, quote, I actually did vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it. End quote. Kerry, starting to feel the heat for his flip-flop voting record, is in West Virginia. Is President Bush doing a good job of defining Kerry as a flip-flopper? And you're saying he flip-flopped on the issue of this. Because he does seem to agonize and flip-flop over and over and over again. He's flip-flopped on all these issues. Beneath Kerry's flip-flopping. is an opportunistic flip-flopper. You're talking flip-flops. New brand of summer footwear, John Kerry flip-flops. They say that he flip-flops a lot. So he's flip-flopped now on every major issue. Would those be the flip-flops? Because he's flip-flopped on everything else. Is Senator Kerry guilty of flip-flopping on the issue? flip-flops like crazy. First of all, flip-flop. You've seen him flip-flop on a whole variety of issues. Opportunistic flip-flopper who doesn't have any principles. Is that a little harsh? I think um, it shows one thing, hmm. the weakness of John Kerry. You're watching Fox News, real journalism, fair and balanced. And just 263 days until you get to cast your vote and decide that George W. Bush deserves a second term. John Kerry may wish he'd taken off his microphone before trashing the GOP. His coarse description of his opponents has cast a lurid glow over the campaign. Presidential hopeful John Kerry got caught on tape in some candid remarks that he didn't want everybody to hear, but we did. John Kerry has been lashing out at President Bush and, by extension, Republicans for a long time. Nothing new there. You see a picture of George Bush, you expect to see, hear organ music that would come out of a church swelling, the, the backlit head, you know, the, the Madonna look, and then a picture of John Kerry flashes and you hear the, the devil's voice, this is the devil, he is evil. Is it true, the reports that we're seeing, did John Kerry on the slopes curse out a Secret Service agent? Is that true? I think Kerry needed this vacation. He was right. showing some fatigue. I mean, the crooks Only 217 days and counting until George W. Bush is reelected. They're saying John Kerry looks French. John Kerry looks French. Kerry, the man who would be America's first French president. When you're at war, there are two models. You have the Churchill, Reagan, Thatcher, Tony Blair, George Bush model, or you have the uh, McGovern, Jimmy Carter, uh, French, John Kerry model. Are the Republicans going to effectively be able to make Kerry French? Good afternoon, everybody, or as John Kerry would say, bonjour. French are thinkers, and that doesn't go into the code of the American presidency. I mean, you know the, the French, the thinker, le penseur, Rodin? I mean, they think, they think, they think, and they never do anything with their thinking. I believe that Mr. Kerry has to get away of this image if he wants to win. Right now, I think, is not in the American archetype. Why? He's on vacation. If the archetype is to take action and you are taking vacation, I mean, you definitely not, uh, you don't fit the code, you are off code. And Mr. So that's Reply, why yes. th uh, thank you very much. You are hereby invited back. Every week, there's so many ways you can play the economic story. At Fox News, it's only the upbeat. They select statistics that prove the economy's moving up, and thank God for President Bush for doing it. The economy, of course, shaping up to be one of the hot button issues in this presidential campaign. Polls show the economy is shaping up to be a major issue of the presidential campaign. They're all amazed at the strength of the economy and how it's picking up day by day. I think the economy is growing, and uh, I think it's going to get stronger. The economy is very, very strong right now. It continues to get stronger. The latest reading on the nation's gross domestic product confirming it rose at a healthy 4.1%. Sales of existing homes up 2% last month. The economy is behaving like it's on steroids at the moment. The fact is that the economy is improving. The economy will roar in 04. Every sign indicates Roar in 04. That sounds like a Bush. 204 days until George W. Bush is reelected. We're creating jobs good, high-paying jobs for the American citizens. The president goes to Charlotte to talk about job training. Buoyed by the 300,000 job figure last week, he can boast his policies are working. New jobs grew last month at the fastest rate in four years. With the, the news this morning, 308,000 new jobs were created last month. They're drinking the Maalox right out of the gallon bucket at the Kerry campaign. <laughs> what this Kerry plan will do is punish successful companies, and that's bad. If you want to destroy jobs in this country, you raise taxes. John Kerry's plan to bring millions of jobs back to America. Well, someone here says, watch out. Kerry's plan will end up killing more jobs instead. I said previously that the market was neutral. 
neutral on John Kerry. I think that was mm. utterly wrong. I think the market is down on John Kerry. When the market goes down, one of the things you often hear is, the market is worried about a Kerry victory. Then out comes a poll showing Kerry with a four or five point lead. Down goes the market big time. And how they know that the market went down because everybody had Kerry on their mind as opposed to everyone was worried about interest rates or everyone looked at the earnings figures and thought they weren't as good as projected. But they, they, they love to pretend that they're Karnak the Magnificent. They can read the mind of the market. Sure, we got terror threats, gas prices sky high, but Forbes says the economy's still strong and getting stronger every day. So there you have it, 196 days till we re-elect George W. Wait, 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 the Bush? election's over? All right, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> it's almost there. I think uh, Fox News, of all our subsidiaries, had the best increase in profits. What makes Murdoch particularly dangerous is that he's foremost a politician. And he will use his immense media power to shape the content, especially the news, that furthers his interests and those of his allies, including uh, the conservative Republican community. After all, Fox News is nothing more than a 24-7 uh, political ad for the GOP. At MSNBC, I worked as a senior producer on the Donahue, Phil Donahue primetime show. From the beginning, they were saying to us, we have to be balanced, giving them instructions not to be too confrontational, don't be too partisan, don't be too angry. Now, by the end of our tenure, balance wasn't enough. And this is the Fox effect. They mandated that any time we had, if we had two uh, left-wing guests, we had to have three right-wing guests. If we had one anti-war guest, we had to have two pro-war guests. And that's how we ended the show. So we're like trying to outfox Fox. You cannot outfox Fox. But MSNBC and the others have tried. CNBC has tried to outfox Fox. Since the corporate structures, uh, corporate ownership of the other channels did not allow anyone to counter program against Fox, you know, in television, the inclination is imitation. You know, I, I think the standard right now is, uh, is Fox. And I want to be as interesting and as edgy as you guys are. It's influencing its competitors. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, MSNBC hired Joe Scarborough. That's why CNN in, in recent weeks has taken to reporting pretty much anything the Bush White House tells it to report. There is a sense now that there is money in the flag, and Fox knows that, and its competitors know that Fox is onto something. Today, news business is geared toward entertainment. It's geared toward, in some cases, propaganda. It's geared toward, ultimately, the bottom line of a big corporation that owns the station, that owns the news operation. It's called the news business for a reason. Uh, it is news, but it's a business. They don't like to spend money doing serious stories. They like to do cheap, easy stories that uh, will get a gut reaction. The thing I think that distresses me more than anything else is that a lot of the news content is not coming straight out of the newsrooms, particularly in television, um, but out of the promotion department. It's expensive to spend time exploring the issues. It's cheap, and everything now is a question of money. If you go to the National Association of Black Journalists, or you go to the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, or you talk to Asian American journalists who are on air, you talk to Native American journalists, you're seeing a diminution in the number of journalists that are locally based. Because in order to save money, and in order to get economies of scale and scope, a lot of the broadcasters are shrinking their employee, employee pool, and they're shrinking them in the news sector, sectors of their stations. So a lot of the young, vibrant people who are getting experience as on-air talent in small towns are seeing those opportunities increasingly diminish. When you let a small number of companies have this much concentrated power, they will always abuse it. It's simply unacceptable in a free society. And if you don't change the system, we can be having this conversation for the next 50 years. We'll be talking about Rupert Murdoch III. Just as health care and the economy um, and the environment are political issues that people are familiar with, Corporate control over the media is also a major political issue. When you have one network that is so powerful and so intent upon warping the dialogue, it limits that discourse. 
it actually influences it to be a narrower discourse. And that's what I think citizens ought to be up in arms about. We can't accept this anymore. If we do accept it, we are handing on to our children and our grandchildren a lesser democracy than we inherited. And that's the one thing we don't have a right to do. It's ironic that it's been, what, 30 years since Patty Chayefsky wrote Network. But I really believe that those prophetic words that were spoken by Peter Finch when he finally got out of the chair and said, it's time, go to the window, shake your fist and say, I'm mad as hell. I'm not gonna take it anymore. I think those are resonant words today. I think people are genuinely upset. Get off your rear end and become an activist. And if you see things that are biased, complain to the outlet and say you won't be watching it anymore. Content has to change. Power has to shift. And I think the only way we can shift power is the only way we've ever been able to shift power, by directly confronting those who hold it and taking it back. Policies have been made behind closed doors by very powerful special interests without any public involvement or participation. And what we've learned in the last few years is when the public gets aware of this and they start organizing, we can change these policies and we can make a system that actually responds to the needs of the people of this country. America's digital destiny is hanging in the balance now. With the right activism, public outcry, we can shape a media environment so that in every community, there are channels that actually serve the public interest. If you are a citizen at home right now, when you turn on talk radio, all you hear is one right-wing nut or another right-wing nut, why don't you go to the radio station and say, I'm sick and tired of this. There are progressive voices out there. We want a balance. If a Fox TV station in, in your town is broadcasting reports that you know to be inaccurate, that you know to be warping the news, you, as citizens, have power. Groups like Code Pink and others have actually demonstrated outside television stations and have made noise about it. You need to basically play the Paul Revere role to uh, you know, kind of ride out into the night alerting people that uh, there's something bad going on here and, and something needs to be done about it. Here's what I'd love to have happen. Family from Nebraska goes to Washington for the family vacation. We're gonna visit the Air and Space Museum, we're going to visit the mall, we're going to visit the Vietnam Memorial, and we're going to visit the FCC to see a commissioner or two to tell them about what we care about. When that happens, you might start to see a little more attention. But you know, it ain't going to happen if you don't try it. We can actually win here. The whole strength of the system has been based on people being apathetic and not thinking they could do anything about it. As soon as we rise up, it collapses like a house of cards. That's the extraordinary development of the last two years. It is not an issue of the right or the left. It is a populist issue about people finally saying it's their democracy and they aren't going to let five companies control the airways for corporate convenience at the expense of public necessity. I come from a community in the, in the state of Maine that's mostly uh, fishing towns, small coastal communities, and uh, for many years we were served by one radio station that everybody listened to. I mean, it was local radio. Every time I debated an opponent when I was running for office, everybody would tune it in in their cars or their home radio, and they would hear what we were feeling differently about. And when Clear Channel bought it, that was the end. You couldn't even count on somebody looking out the window and telling you if it was a good day or a bad day or if the fog was coming in. But what was really interesting to me was that people got so angry, there was a local group that organized and attempted to get a low-power FM radio license. Uh, they had a hard-fought battle. Uh, Clear Channel opposed them, and they actually won, and now there is a little radio station operated out of a garage in that town. All volunteers, anybody can play the music that they want, but at 5 o'clock every day, they tune in to the dialogue of what's going on in that community. Come and whisper in my ear, give us dirt and laundry. Kick them with the up, kick them with the down, kick them with the up, kick them with the down. Kick them with the up, kick them with the down. 
what we've been doing over the last decade is to create this alternative infrastructure so that we now have an online audience of 10,000 unique visitors per day to our homepage, plus the over the air audience of our new uh, low power FM radio station and very soon we're going to have public access TV in this community. So we're, we've got three legs of a, of a stool here of an alternative media infrastructure that gives us a means of communicating among ourselves and not just relying on the occasional letter to the editor in the corporate newspaper or almost no coverage in uh, the broadcast media because they're all owned by Clear Channel and, and uh, Sinclair or Fox. Media Council started, one of our first projects was to um, recruit unorganized youth of color, teenagers, and have them study the Fox affiliate station in the Bay Area. When we did the study, we were able to do an editorial meeting. It was the first time in probably 10 or 15 years that a constituency group locally had actually ever came and demanded anything from them. They just get to do whatever they want. Nobody cares, nobody understands that they can demand anything. So it was a pretty momentous moment for us, you know, to, to both demand something and get it from a Fox affiliate, but also to be one of the first, you know, folks to come forward. And that's, that's something that I think is a, is a trend that we're trying to start now. Marginalized people don't have any concept that they can go to an editor in groups and demand something.